Good day. So good to be here with you. It's been a couple of weeks. Um, I don't know uh, where you are in this world, possibly post mostly in Canada, I would suspect. And uh, last weekend was our Labor Day weekend. And one of the common things we do at our church, our Redwater Alliance, is we go uh, away to what we call family camp, to a nearby Bible camp not too far down the road from where we are, and we spend at least Saturday, Sunday, and part of Monday uh, enjoying fellowship and the beauty of that camp and the, and the lake that it's by. So I hope you've had a great Labor Day weekend, and many of you are uh, back, bringing your kids back to school, and things are sort of switching into that kind of gear to fall and the leaves and the soon cold weather. And Lord, and we just thank you for being with us, with me, Thank you for inviting you, uh, me into your homes. We want to continue now in the sermon series that we've been on for quite a while, um, at least 10 weeks, I think. Uh, I haven't really been counting, but I would think that would be right to consider that, 10 weeks. And uh, in our sermon series, as we study together First Peter, and we're calling it A Living Hope. So with no further ado, we move into the uh, sermon series in First Peter. Uh, there's a fellow by the name of David Williams. He was a former medical doctor, a former missionary, and he's currently a lead trainer for the Church Missionary Society located in Australia. And he presented a four-article uh, series examining the Western worldview. And William theorizes that there has been what he calls, quote, a radical change in the Western worldview. And he goes on to say, our culture has moved from a guilt, innocent, innocence culture to becoming a pain, pleasure culture. So according to Williams, uh, the Western culture in which we reside makes most of its important decisions, quote, based on what brings us pleasure and avoids pain. And one of the examples that he gives in these articles is the pain-pleasure worldview was the basis in which the same-sex marriage vote and euthanasia debates were argued. Uh, it goes something like this. How dare someone suggest that I should avoid the pleasure of marrying anyone I like? Or how dare someone impose on me a painful death if it could be avoided? And then William in these articles moves from the wider culture to the church in the West and explains that some of the parts or some of the, uh, some of the church, the wider church has been, as he said, seduced by the pain-pleasure worldview. And it's quite interesting to note that William navigates to this particular group of Christians after presenting a thesis. He moves to the ever-popular prosperity teaching in the church in the 21st century uh, context. And one finds that, indeed, prosperity teaching has bought into the pain-pleasure model and preaches the message of Jesus in ways that oppose the Word of God. And now William uh, provides some anecdotal support for his point. Uh, he, he discusses or, uh, a conversation that he had with a former employee of the Christian uh, bookstore chain Kurang in Australia. And he points out uh, that the best-selling authors during this particular employee's tenure were all prosperity teachers. Folks like Joel Osteen and Joyce Meyer, T.D. Jakes, uh, to mention a few personalities. Now, if you and I were to do a search on our favorite search engine, asking the question, for example, how many books has Joel Osteen sold, provide, you will find that you will find some anecdotal evidence to support William's thesis, William's point. For example, Prosperity, Pastor Joel Osteen's 2004 book, Your Best Life Now, sold more than 100 million copies. So I guess the question is, how does this support William's point concerning the pain-pleasure worldview in prosperity teaching? So why don't we let him answer that question? To quote him, to quote Williams, quote, those living in a pain-pleasure paradigm focus on the now 
at the expense of the not yet. Therefore, there's no incentive to delay gratification. Prosperity teaching speaks directly to this reality, offering your best life now. Well, this, of course, seems, no, no doubt, does turn God into a distributor or a dealer of pleasure for the believer at minimal cost or minimal risk. Well, with all this in mind, uh, let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Peter. Please, I, I would encourage you to have a Bible, a Bible in front of you as you hear this message. That way it keeps you and me accountable to each other and helps you to grow and into maturity as a follower of Christ and helps me as well. So 1 Peter chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 9 through to 25. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every, every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are straying like sheep, but now, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd an overseer of your souls. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Dear Father, we thank you for this time together. As I think of those who might be seeing this, I don't know them. I can't see them. They can see me. They can hear me. I pray for them, Lord, that they would, by, by this time, as we walk, walk through this letter so far, would be willing to allow your spirit to uh, test them, to teach them, to convict them if necessary. And Lord, I pray God also that we would walk away from this message today encouraged and hopeful in our lives, no matter what is happening in our lives, whether it is the good or the bad, and maybe even some of the ugly. Lord, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that has beauty and has ugliness, all side by side. So Father, we thank you for this time. May you uh, be glorified, and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, uh, we have been away uh, from a while from our study here in Apostle Peter's letter. Uh, two weeks ago, actually August the 25th, was the last time we opened the pages of this wonderful letter. And of course, much can transpire in two weeks in our lives, so it behooves us to do a slight recap. We won't spend too much time there, but we need to do something. And why, why don't we start by asking a question? Let's ask this question. 
What theme or themes have been revealed to us to date? And I hope during this time that you've had a chance to, you know, more, off, more than once at least to read through this letter. It'll only take you about 10 minutes to read through 1 Peter. And I think you will find that there are some themes that kind of stand out. And when we think about the reading that we have had today in our text, uh, we have a clear indication, or at least I'll call it a clear clue, of a theme found throughout the Apostle's letter. So why don't we read verse 20 and 21 again together. Verse 20 and 21. Verse 20. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Back in chapter 1, if you remember the Apostle Peter's introductory comments, we know that he was writing to believers who, according to Paul, had received God's great mercy. He had caused them to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. So, friends, these first century believers who were dispersed through five Roman provinces in present-day Turkey had put their faith and trust in the resurrected Christ for their salvation, that they would one day see that fully realized when he returned. But in the meantime... Or as the Apostle Paul put it in chapter 1, verse 6. Or Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter put it, pardon me. I always get those two confused. Apostle Peter said, though now for a little while, or in the meantime, if you will, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Key phrase there, grieved by various trials. Back in chapter 2, while acknowledging, uh, we looked at this, I think, two weeks ago, a first century reality, the master slave, the master servant uh, context of the first century, the apostle applied the sorrows these servants, these slaves were suffering unjustly, we find in verse 19, to all believers in chapter 4, where Peter said, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice as so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. We find that in chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. So when we have this in our minds, we can say, I think, with certainty and with reason, that suffering for one's trust and faith in Christ is a major theme in Peter's letter. A major theme. And in regard to suffering for Christ, we also find the focus in Peter's letter wasn't necessarily on persecution from the state or even violent persecution, but believers were, as I asked you to remember, grieved by various trials. He said that in chapter 1, verse 6. So this kind of persecution was, uh, came in different forms and from a variety of places. Alienation, shame, slander, loss of jobs, and other kinds of abuses for their faith in Christ. Really no different than many Christians suffer today in the 21st century context. Additionally, we want to consider that suffering for one's faith in Christ was not lost on God. That's what Peter would say. And it's not lost on God for us in our time as well. For the believer suffers while doing good, according to Peter, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Verse 20. And we want to add another layer, suffering for one's faith in Christ, or as Peter put it, testing of your genu- the genuineness of your faith has a result. And what was that result? What, what, will that be res- what, what will that result be? Pardon me. Well, Peter said, may result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. It tests your faith and then will result in praise and glory when Jesus is revealed when he comes. So in summary, while there are other themes in Peter's letter, we see a theme of holiness, we see a theme of salvation. Suffering is a key theme, a major theme throughout the Apostle Peter's letter. And it's the major reason 
the Apostle Peter would write his letter to encourage his audience, to comfort his audience, to keep them from becoming downhearted, downcast, discouraged, and even possibly prevent some from giving up on their faith in Christ altogether. This brings up a question that I want to ask you. What is your calling as a believer? Have you ever thought of that? What is your calling as a believer? What is your calling as a follower of Jesus Christ as you walk in his footsteps? I put that question in my search engine on my computer and came up with 1,970,000 results. I found one blog with this title, How to Live a Life of Purpose as a Christian, Seven Keys to Discovering Your God-Given Calling. I didn't read it. You see, I have enough keys on my keychain. Another article was titled, How to Find Your Calling. Well, thanks for finding an answer. Another, what is Christian calling and what is it not? Well, friends, we could go on for another 1,966,000 times. But let's not do that. Yet our question is still before us. What is your calling? What is my calling as a follower of Jesus Christ? You know, if you were to do a general survey of our current popular Christian culture, it reveals a number of folks who seem to have found their particular calling, their particular niche, if you will, in Christianity in our context. And they rise to the top and they get the majority of attention for years to come. You know, some very popular and very good musicians, some very good and popular evangelists, 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 I can't say it. Pardon me. We'll move on. Uh, popular Christian leaders and their articles, their books, their, their videos, etc. You know, these Christians have been have spending time and time, decades, working on the area that God had called them. And I say good for them and good for the gospel. Absolutely. But friends, you know, you and me, the great majority of believers today aren't necessarily called to one particular ministry work. I would make a terrible musician. Yes, I can keep a beat. I have a tone in my ear. I can hear things. I can even play a little bit on a guitar. But I would make a terrible musician. I'm not called to any one particular ministry work, other than what you see me do now, I guess, as a pastor and a preacher. But the great majority of us are not called to any one particular. And the New Testament writers, in one voice, would answer a question simply by saying this to you and to me. Serve God where you are in the power and gifting of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit has given to you and me. Let's keep it even simpler. Bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. But let me say this. But what if I told you that Christians from the very first 125 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost to our day, Peter would say, have been called, in verse 21. Called for what? To suffer for their faith in Christ. Now, how does that sit with you? And now let's bring along with that William's theory of pain and pleasure culture, the pain and pleasure culture impact on the church. And we can't deny that this particular worldview has impacted the church. And when believers buy in the pain-pleasure culture, we com- and we compare that with the Apostle Peter's letter, just the letter of Apostle Peter, maybe even the New Testament, but this is f- focused on Apostle Peter's exhortation in his letters, there's really only one conclusion that we can come to. Believers who buy into the pain-pleasure uh, worldview have bought into a picture of Christian faith that is fundamentally, I would say, radically different than the biblical record. Fundamentally and radically different than the Christian historical record over the past 2,000 years. And if you were to pay attention to the, uh, what's happening in the world amongst Christians in the past few years, radically different than even our recent times. Well, we want to take some time now and look closer at verse 21 to 25. Let's situate this text in its context. Remember, the number one rule of proper 
biblical exegesis or a biblical study, however you want to say it, is context, context, context. So let's situate these verses in its context. So chapter 2 then, 13 to 25, one include verse 13, all the way to 25, the Apostle Peter was specific about dealing uh, with the believers that he was writing to. For believers who live as God's chosen race. That's what God calls you and me and his first century audience. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a, a people for his own possession. That's back in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. We go back, back to chapter 1 again. Apostle Peter there described the set apartness of believers in terms of holiness. Do you remember what he said? He said to his audience, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Here's another theme that comes out in this letter, holiness. Since it is written, then he quotes from Leviticus, what God said to people, the people of Israel, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We find this in chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. So we can now there get a little deeper, dig a little deeper and ask another question. How is a believer considered holy? Think about it. A believer's holiness occurs, why? Because of their right relationship with God by receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who saves, forgives them of their sin and saves the believers from their sins, and then they inherit eternal life. It's the believer's position in Christ that sets them apart from the world. Remember what Peter said here in chapter 2. You are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse, verse 10. Here in this context that we're reading, 21, uh, 13 to 25, Apostle Peter is giving specific teaching, specific guidance, how to engage culture as the people of God. Not only in the first century, but it is applicable from the first all the way to our time as well. We just have to contextualize it, if you will. One more time, we should read verse 21 together. Let's read verse 21 again together. Verse 21, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, living you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. So we ask the question of verse 21, what does it mean? Well, we go to verse 18 to 20. We notice there where the apostle Peter addressed the why and how believers must submit to human authority and their masters. Verse 18, Peter said, Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Just. That's the how. But what about the why? Verse 19, For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. Verse 19. So to the point, my friends, submitting to human authority is a necessary, essential part of a believer's submission to God. For if one endures suffering, as Christ has, because of unjust treatment, the apostle said, this is gracious. Another translation is used, commendable. Another great way to translate, this is gracious or this is commendable before God. Let's turn to another New Testament writer, James, who was writing to Jewish Christians. And he begins his letter by saying, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now some of you might be saying, really, James? Count it all joy? And some of you might even say, as the culture does, how dare you impose pain? But we should be fair to James. We should listen to what the whole verse says, or the whole context says. Let's listen to James. We'll do it again. James said, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith, there we go, produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, lacking in nothing. James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. My friends, the Apostle Peter, James, and the, two, and the other New Testament writers conclude that God's will for a believer is what Peter said in his letter. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. 
verse 21. Now, I wanted us to take some time, as we think about all that's been said, uh, to take a closer look at Christ's suffering. And we want to look at that from Peter's perspective here in verse 22 and 23. Let's read that together, verse 22 and 23. Verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So we ask, what is the apostle doing here? What is he suggesting? Is he not making a case? Is he not making a case that Jesus' suffering while, on, while he was on, on this earth was unjust? In other words, Jesus suffered for doing what is good and right. Jesus endured pain and all that came with it willingly in submission to God the Father. Let's take a look how Jesus dealt with the, must have been agonizing uh, uh, anxiety or whatever. We know that he sweated blood in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was going to be arrested and then uh, charged and, and tried, uh, legally tried and, and sent onto the cross. We find in Matthew's Gospel 26, we find Jesus and his disciples, they go to Gethsemane. And he uh, takes James, um, James and John and Peter with him a little further. And then Jesus goes on by himself and he prays and he said this, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26, verse 39. The second time Jesus went back to pray, he said this, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done, Matthew 26, 42. And he went back one more time to pray, a third time, and he repeated what he said. Here's the point. I think Peter has made his case. Jesus suffered unjustly out of submission to his Father. He was entrusting, according to Peter himself, to him who judges justly, verse 23. And this is the other thing that we need to notice here in these two verses, that Jesus suffered for you and me. He suffered for those first century Christians and every single believer since that time. He suffered unjustly for you and me. And it tells us in verse 22 that he committed no sin and neither was deceit found in his mouth. Jesus suffered willingly without any wrongdoing on his part. And we can ask, what does this mean for the believer in Peter's context? And of course, what does it mean for you and me today? What does it mean for believers today? Well, first of all, suffering for Christ was a, re a reality in the first century believer as it is for the 21st century believer. Christians are called to follow Jesus' example. And following Jesus' example and life may bring suffering for doing the good that we are called to do. And believers, as Peter has already told us in chapter 4, should not be surprised if suffering comes their way for doing the will of God. Because the question that a believer should ask when persecution comes their way is this question. How should we respond? How should they respond? So let me ask you another question. Lots of questions here today. If someone is abusive toward you, threatens you, insult you, reviles you, how would you respond? Give it a thought. Don't respond too quickly. Don't give me a Sunday school answer. Give me a real answer. Is it not our human instinct to throw insults back, to threaten back, to revile back? How did Christ respond when he was reviled? Well, Peter said that he did not revile in return. Verse 23. How did Christ respond when he was threatened? Peter said when he suffered, he did not threaten. Verse 23. You know, it's interesting to note that Apostle Peter in four of the five verses of our text today that we're really looking at closely, 21 to 25, four of the, those five directly alludes to Isaiah's prophecy concerning the suffering servant of God that you find in Isaiah. Verse 22 to verse 24 
uh, 25, allude to Isaiah 53, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, and 11. You see, when Jesus was insulted by the Jewish leaders and the Roman guards while he was on the cross, he refused to respond in kind. And according to Luke's gospel, Jesus prayed for his accusers. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Luke 23, 34. When he was beaten and tortured and crucified, he did not threaten those who were persecuting him. And we often forget who Jesus is. We need to remember who Jesus is in this story in the New Testament, but even today. Who is Jesus? You know, if he wanted to respond, it would not have been some idle threat or some insult. We go back to Gethsemane. Remember in that story, the apostle Peter cut off the ear of the high priest's servant in some crazy idea that he could defend Jesus from the guards. And Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place. By the way, he healed the guy's ears too. And then he said this, do you not think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Who is Jesus? He's the one that can ask God the Father for 12 legions of angels. And they would come. But then he said, but how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Matthew 26, verse 52 to 53. Jesus resisted any kind of urge to respond in kind, to insult. Jesus made a decision to trust God, his Father. He trusted that his Father would vindicate him, that his Father would provide all that he needed to endure, and Jesus would fulfill the purpose he came for. And friends, this begs another question. What exactly was Jesus' pur purpose? Well, Peter answers that for us. He himself, that is Christ, bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Verse 24. What was Jesus' purpose? To suffer unjustly. Did you know that if Jesus had not willingly suffered unjustly, you and I would remain lost? in our sins, deserving only the wrath of Christ, our oh God. But thanks be to God. The Apostle Peter, see, we see in this text, reminded his readers and reminds you and me today that he, Christ, bore our sins and his body on the tree. Jesus fulfilled, we know, over 300 Old Testament prophecies in his earthly ministry. But most certainly, by carrying our sins and his body on the cross, he fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy where Isaiah said, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed by, for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. I do want to make an important note here, or reference, that many today interpret verse 24 here in 1 Peter chapter 2 as a promise from God for physical healing. I'm not saying that God doesn't heal. But according to this context, some would say that this is a promise for God for physical healing. And some go even further. Unfortunately, and sadly, many of the pro popular and prominent prosperity teachers pull verse 24 out of its context and teach that this promise is absolutely guaranteed divine physical healing for every believer. Yet Peter, what was he doing here? He was using a play on words by quoting Isaiah 53, 5. He was pointing to the believer's healing from the penalty and the power of sin by Christ's wounds. It's clear from Isaiah 53, 5 and in this text. By his death in our place, his suffering for our own good, the Christian is healed forgiven by God for our sins, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Verse 24. So as we wrap this up, we need to ask another question. What will we do with all this? Friends, do we go along with the popular culture and focus on the now at the expense of the not yet? Do we join with many in our current Christian culture that have bought into the pain-pleasure model? 
Do we follow the Joel Olsteins and the Joyce Myers and the T.G. Jakes leading the prosperity movement, proclaiming, quite frankly, a different gospel? Do we seek to receive the pleasures we desire now? Now? Do we seek a God who will bring us prosperity and fulfillment at the minimal personal cost? Yes, God is our personal Santa Claus. Do we avoid the slow process of holiness? Because sanctification, my friends, which is the process of holiness, is a lifelong journey. And we'll never get to 100% perfection. Do we avoid that slow process of holiness? Do we do everything possible to avoid suffering for Christ, hiding in our bubbles? If this is so, your faith, my faith, is radically different than what we find in the biblical record. You know, friends, Isaiah said of Israel, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, Isaiah 53, 6. Is that not so the case for many today? Apostle Peter said to his first century audience, For you are straying like sheep, but now return to the shepherd and overseer of your souls, verse 25. We should be reminded what Jesus said about sheep. He said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. John 10, 14, 15. My friends, believers are called to follow in the steps of Jesus and sometimes let me bring suffering and persecution. May we be more like the Apostle Paul who said this to the Philippian church. He said to them, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward, go- upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Let us pray. Dear, dear Lord, thank you for this message. It has so encouraged my heart. In a world that seems go crazy sometimes, and we wonder what's going to happen. But Lord, we know you are sovereign and you have the world in the palm of your hands. And better yet, you have the people in the bosom of your heart. And we thank you for that. And help us, Lord, to be courageous and know that you have us no matter what. And as we go forth and we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, that we proclaim that it's time to repent for the kingdom of God is here. That whatever may come, We know that one day all will be made right and we will be with you on a new earth and a new heaven in our glorified bodies. And wow, Lord, is that going to be something to behold. Until then, in the meantime, we follow you closely. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless, friends. I'm out of words. God bless. Shalom.